Hatred, fear, oppression, savagery, pride, relief, and security. These are all emotions felt by citizens of the galaxy at the mention of the First Galactic Empire, a regime which has left a tarnished legacy of order, violence, and evil upon the galaxy and those who lived under its shadow. While the Imperial Army enforced the new order upon the population of the galaxy at large, it was the Imperial Navy which held the galaxy and the Empire's unrelenting grip, ensuring rebellious systems were isolated from the rest of the galaxy, trade lanes defended, and worlds, loyalist and oppressed alike, convinced of the invincibility of the monolithic new order. Possessing of hundreds of individual ship classes, thousands upon thousands of ships, controlling millions of systems, and employing billions of crewers, techs, pilots, gunners, engineers, officers, and agents, the Navy would become, at its height, the single largest employer in the galaxy. Employment in its ranks being one of the many reasons and means by which the Empire attempted to generate loyalty to the state among its citizenry. Founded at the end of the Clone Wars in 19 BBY from the space-borne elements of the Grand Army of the Republic, the early Imperial Navy was a hodgepodge of vessel classes. Both those built for the Republic during the war, such as the Venator, Acclimator, Arquitans, Pelta, and Consular classes, as well as vessels seized from sector and planetary defense forces, all found their way into to Imperial service. These ships were generally unsuited to the operating environment the Imperial Navy found itself in. With the very oldest ships in the fleet being too decrepit and obsolete for much further service, and even the latest designs in service, like the Venator, being built for a total war environment, where range, reliability, and crew comfort were second-hand considerations after the combat capabilities of the vessel itself. In short, the Empire needed vessels with long endurance, comfortable accommodation for an extensive crew needed for prolonged voyages, and the ability to perform multiple roles to save costs and allow one or two ships to act where previously several ships with single-purpose designs would be required. Immediately post-war, the Empire prioritized replacing the oldest ships from its ranks, continuing production of wartime designs and accepting several classes which had been in the early planning stages at war's end. This policy would allow the Imperial Navy to expand massively in its first years. But even as these programs were going on, the Empire had begun designing a new fleet of vessels purpose-built to suit its requirements. In addition to a massive expansion of new and existing Imperial shipyards, these sweeping construction plans were intended to serve the dual purposes of increasing Imperial control over the galaxy, and also stimulating economic growth and goodwill towards the Empire through employment in many war-ravaged systems. Entering service at various points roughly a decade into the Empire's reign, new ship classes such as the Imperial Star Destroyer, Vindicator-class heavy cruiser, and the extended TIE family of starfighters and service vehicles, as well as numerous other designs, quickly captured the mind of the public, becoming manifest the feelings each citizen of the Empire had about the state, both positive and negative. Throughout its existence, the massive amounts of money the Empire was spending on its navy was often criticized with many mentioning the growing downward trend of the galactic economy and the lack of a credible threat, foreign or domestic, as reason to limit military spending rather than increase it each year. But these increasingly diminished voices of reason in the government did nothing to even slow the growth of the navy, with Emperor Palpatine himself ordering that the naval budget be increased, year after year, even as some in the Navy itself began to voice concern over the expanding size of the fleet, the Emperor apparently believing that military spending would trickle down and benefit the general galactic economy, as servicemen and shipyard workers spent their government paychecks in local businesses. By the time of the Battle of Yavin, the Imperial Navy was the largest naval force the galaxy had ever seen in its prolonged history, with its growth only predicted to continue growing. 
The loss of the Death Star to the presumably shattered Rebel Alliance forces over Yavin 4 would see this policy end, as the Empire suddenly had to deal with a series of rebellions, which continued to only grow in size as the Galactic Civil War began in earnest. Over the next several years, the previously cowed galaxy would rise in one revolt after another. Putting down these revolts would become a task of ever-increasing size and difficulty, an insurgency of a scale even the bloated Imperial Starfleet proved far too small to adequately perform. No sooner would one rebellion in one sector be put down than an even larger one a few systems over break out and take its place. Hoth was hoped to be a decisive battle for the Empire. Since Yavin, Imperial forces had hoped to find the new secret rebel headquarters probe droids discovering the base by chance and nearly being ignored. But although the Empire achieved an impressive victory, with a textbook planetary assault through contested orbital space and fierce ground resistance, even the Lord Darth Vader could not change the fact that Alliance leadership had never intended their Echo Base as their headquarters, instead using the site for covert operations, training and repair or refit of damaged ships and equipment, rather than as a proper fixed capital. By 4 ABY, the majority of the rebellions had been either put down completely, or else contained to a handful of systems, and although the Rebel Alliance remained a serious threat to the continued survival of the Empire, it was one that an increasing number of fleet commanders finally thought they had gotten a handle on. The Emperor intended Endor, the site of construction for his second Death Star, to be the decisive battle of the war, and in this he would prove to be largely correct, with a disproportionate number of senior imperial leadership, both military and civilian, perishing in the destruction of the orbital battle station, or during the routing of the imperial fleet present there. Following this battle, the Empire, and by natural extension the Navy, quickly splintered into competing successor states, warlord states, petty kingdoms, false empires, and avowedly sovereign entities. This would allow the alliance, turned New Republic, to quickly gain strength and begin chewing up the various post-Endor imperial states to become the de facto galactic government in a few short years. With what was left of the empire quickly falling into irrelevance, despite occasional spurts of renewed victor, Vigor, as one warlord or moth, achieved brief superiority over his fellows before falling to New Republic forces. The Imperial Navy inherited many of the same conventions as those used by the Old Republic in the classification of its ship types, keeping many of the same types of ships, but using them in slightly different ways, in situations both better suited to the needs of the Imperial Navy, and in keeping with its doctrine. At the largest end of the fleet were the command ships, known by many colloquial terms such as Super Star Destroyer, Battle Cruiser, Dreadnought, and others. Command ships were massive vessels with their origins before the Clone Wars. These ships were designed for the command and coordination of an entire battle or sector fleet, having the communications, equipment, sensors, and firepower to do so. Due to their size, the vessels often are armed for planetary assaults as well, having the firepower to batter planetary shields and the troops embarked to take over a world once the shield fell. Below command ships are the powerful Star Destroyers. Designed for action in battle lines, Star Destroyers are the standard battleships in the Imperial Navy. Later classes such as the Imperial Line would also combine the roles of assault ships and fighter carrier into the Star Destroyer hull, which had been established as far back as the High Republic. Also known as Heavy Cruiser, the Star Cruiser was, after the Star Destroyer, the most impressive ship in the Imperial Navy. Although few classes were built for the fleet during the reign of the Empire, many older ships, such as the ubiquitous Dreadnought Heavy Cruiser, would be reclassed as heavy cruisers or star cruisers. Used in many of the same roles as the larger star destroyer, namely patrol and enforcement of imperial rule in regions prone to resist the rule of the empire, the star cruiser was a more common sight in isolated sectors, 
where a full Star Destroyer was unnecessary, but, it, but a large Imperial presence still required. A general-purpose ship, medium cruisers such as the Strike class were meant to serve in roles such as scouts, screening, and assault units as part of a battle fleet. The centerpiece of small battle groups of their own, escorts for merchant ships through contested regions, and even as explorers and transports. As a result of this utility, a large variety of this type of ship were operated by the Empire, with both classes predating the New Order and ships designed during the reign of the Empire being used in numbers. A wildly diverse range of ships fell under the broad designation of light cruisers. Some of them, such as the Arquitans and related 546-class cruisers, were almost miniature capital ships themselves, meant to perform many of the same roles but on a lesser scale while others, such as the Carrick class, were built for escort and strike missions as part of a fleet. Although some effort for a standardized series of related light cruiser classes was made by the Empire, the sheer diversity of types in service and in production meant that these efforts made little progress even twenty years into the reign of the Empire. In the Empire, frigate was a term that thanks to centuries of murk between light cruisers and the type, was applied to few ships officially, but used often informally by their crews. Within Frigate there existed a large number of variations, such as the Nebulon series of escort frigates, attack frigates, cargo frigates, assault frigates, and others. Just as diverse as the term frigate, corvettes were the smallest ships to serve in the Imperial Navy as they had been in the Navy of the Republic. Several different types of corvette were built, typically split into patrol, escort, and fleet duties. The Empire placed a heavy focus on corvette production, building large numbers of three major types. The Vigil-class patrol corvette, a modified variant of the common CR-90, as an escort corvette, and finally the Raider class, which fulfilled the fleet escort, strike, and scout duties. Beneath corvettes, the Empire operated a diverse range of shuttles, transports, freighters, gunboats, scouts, bombers, and fighters. These ships are so numerous that they will get their own video at some point, but they are there, and they are certainly important. The Imperial Navy was not intended as a primarily space combat oriented force. In a departure from its predecessor organizations such as the GAR Space Forces, Instead, the Navy was meant to serve as a peacekeeping and law enforcement-focused organization, as the Empire lacked any peer-level opponents to challenge it directly. While of course the Empire operated many battle fleets, a large portion of its fleet was orientated towards holding planets and maintaining order, or else retaking worlds which had driven away Imperial ground forces. Although its reign was short and bloody, and its defeat tied directly to limitations and flaws within the Imperial Navy, it was still a powerful force which introduced many changes to traditional naval warfare. The designs it operated instilling fear or awe in equal proportion to all who beheld its monstrous star destroyers, angular cruisers, and agile-looking corvettes. And its mark upon the galaxy moving forward cannot be ignored. If you've made it this far, I would like to take a brief moment to thank my Ann Patreon. I got a Patreon a couple of days ago, and I just thought I would give a quick shout-out to them. Uh, I'm not going to do name, because I don't have it in front of me, and I don't want to guess. But thank you to that person. You are much appreciated. For those of you who didn't know, I have a Patreon. It's linked below. Uh, if you like the video, be sure to subscribe, follow, like, all of that stuff, whatever it may be. Regardless of if you're a Patreon or not, or if you enjoyed the video or not, uh, have a nice day.